how's it going? My name's Joe, and with Justice League in theaters, today I thought it would be fun to show you my collection of action figures based on another Zack Snyder movie. Maybe a better Zack Snyder movie. The Watchmen. I have a complete collection of Watchmen movie figures from DC Direct, and while I'm at it, I thought I'd also show you my complete collection of comic book style Watchmen figures by Mattel. This video is going to be about all things Watchmen. The action figures, the movie, and the comic book series. This video is also really timely because DC Comics is bringing the Watchmen characters into the regular DC Universe with this Doomsday Clock comic book series. I think DC Editorial is going to use Dr. Manhattan as a scapegoat for all their continuity blunders in recent years. So without further ado, let's get on with the review. Cheers. So this is a custom made diorama slash display base that I made specifically for my Watchmen figures. The base here is two slabs of inexpensive insulation styrofoam. And basically I covered this with sheetrock patch to help fill in these gaps. Also create a barrier so that I could spray paint it because if you just spray paint styrofoam then it will melt. The back wall here is made out of styrofoam craft bricks glued to foam core board and I painted this all black and then I dry brushed it with lots of different shades of light gray acrylic paints. I painted all this graffiti, I painted the splatters here, I did a little bat symbol like Dark Knight Rises, that's me and my wife's initials, um, I did a little Superman S Shield logo, uh, there's Sublime, that's one of my favorite bands after Tom Penny and the Heartbreakers and Jimi Hendrix Experience, and then I also wrote Joker was here in purple, just like the 1989 Batman movie, and then I went over all the graffiti with different shades of gray acrylic paints and I also gave it a little paint wash make it look like it was really weathered like the graffiti had been there for a long time. And I'm pretty happy with the way this turned out I think it services a really nice backdrop for my Watchmen action figures. So I really like a lot of Zack Snyder movies in general I like his Dawn of the Dead remake, 300 was really cool Sucker Punch wasn't exactly a good movie but at least it was interesting and the action scenes were unlike anything else I've ever seen before or since. And I liked Man of Steel more than most people, even though I'll admit that it has a lot of flaws. Most of the problems in Man of Steel are the fault of the screenwriters, more so than Zack Snyder. The characterization of Jonathan Kent is my biggest complaint. When Clark asks him if he should have let the kids drown in the bus, Jonathan Kent should have quickly said, no, of course not. And I believe that the gratuitous action and collateral damage caused by the Superman Zod fight at the end was a direct result from Superman Returns being such an unexciting snooze fest. Superman doesn't even throw a punch in that movie. And the last thing you want is another boring Superman movie. Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice has already been talked about a million times on the internet, so I won't get into it too much here, but it is a complete mess and I actively dislike it. I think it's a shame that Zack Snyder doesn't get any credit for the success of Wonder Woman, because he had a hand in casting Gal Gadot as the character, he also had a hand in the story for the Wonder Woman solo movie, and I put those two things in the win column. My favorite Zack Snyder movie is The Watchmen. All the performances are spot on in my opinion. I really love all the music and how it was used in the movie. A lot of people bitch about the use of slow motion in Zack Snyder movies, but I love how you can see all of the action in his fight scenes really clearly, just like a comic book. I think it was an improvement to omit the spaghetti monster and all that Black Freighter bullshit from the movie. It makes the story less convoluted, and the comic book loses all its momentum every time that Black Freighter business pops up. Another thing people complain about is the violence and gore in the Watchmen movie. However, if you go back and read the comics, you'll find that the movie is much less violent and bloody than it could have been. In the Watchmen comics, there are several splash pages depicting dozens of dead bodies littering the streets and hanging out of windows. There's blood pouring down the sides of buildings and running down the streets. And using Dr. Manhattan's technology to vaporize those people instead makes the movie much less violent and bloody than the comic book series. I think the special effects in The Watchmen were all really well done. And I don't find the use of green screen as obnoxious as other movies like the prequel trilogy. Really, I only have two complaints about The Watchmen movie. Even if you didn't already know that Ozymandias is going to turn out to be the villain, the movie basically tells you the first time you see him. The movie kind of telegraphs it with lighting and an ominous tone. 
My biggest gripe about Zack Snyder's Watchmen is Dr. Manhattan's giant blue wang. It makes sense that a guy who's basically a god, losing his humanity, wouldn't give a fuck anymore and would walk around naked all the time. In the comics, you barely notice Dr. Manhattan's dick. It's just a little bloop. But in the movie, his giant blue wang is distracting, where it could have been handled more discreetly with different camera angles and blocking. Or they could have just animated the speedo on him and left it out entirely. Alright, first up, let's take a look at one of my favorite Watchmen movie figures. This is the original Silk Spectre, or Sally Jupiter figure. Sally Jupiter was actually one of the Minutemen. And this figure sports a really nice likeness to the actress from the movie. The paint detail on this figure is pretty well done, and I especially like the way her blouse and skirt are painted to make them seem like sheer fabric with darker clothing underneath. This figure also has real fishnet stockings that are also really well done too. The articulation for this figure is pretty good for this line. She has a neck that swivels back and forth, her hair doesn't really get in the way, but it does prevent her from looking up, and she doesn't look down very much either but you can tilt her head from side to side. She has a swivel shoulder joint. She has a bicep swivel on her right arm. And single jointed elbows. And a wrist swivel on her left arm. This figure has swivel hips that go much further back than they go forward. And she has single jointed knees that are really well hidden by the fishnet stockings. It looks like there'd be a swivel joint here and maybe here at the top of her boot, but there's not. This movie style Rorschach figure from the DC Direct series is one of the more disappointing figures from this set. That's because his articulation is so limited and he's permanently stuck in this weird walking or strutting pose. This Rorschach figure comes with this gas powered grapnel gun the sculpted and painted detail on it looks very accurate to the movie. Unfortunately, it doesn't stay in his hand very well, so I have to use a clear plastic rubber band to keep it in place. This figure also comes with an alternate right hand that you can swap in and out. The articulation on this Rorschach figure is really, really limited. He has a neck joint that can go back and forth just a little bit. He has swivel shoulders. He has single jointed elbows with almost no range of motion. He has swivel wrists. And he also has swivel legs. These are really bizarre. I don't even know why they bothered. And as bad as Rorschach's articulation is, he is not the worst out of this bunch. Next up we have the DC Direct movie Night Owl figure. And this might be my first or second favorite out of the entire set. I really love all the sculpted detail in his costume. I think the costume design for this Night Owl figure is much better than the comic book version. And I think it's kind of curious how much the tactical bat suit in Justice League looks like this movie version of Night Owl. This figure also comes with a removable crescent moon shaped weapon that plugs into the front of his belt. Unfortunately, he doesn't hold it very well, so I typically leave it on his belt like that. This Night Owl figure has pretty nice neck articulation. He can go from side to side. He can tilt his head back and forth really well. He can look down pretty well. About the only thing he can't do is look up. He has ball hinge shoulders that go out about this far, go down about this far, and they swivel back and forth, restricted a little bit by the cape. He has single jointed elbows with better range of motion than most of the figures in this line. He has wrist swivel. Again, nothing in the waist. His hips can go back and forth about that far. And he has single jointed knees. Here we have the DC Direct Classic Night Owl or Hollis Mason version of Night Owl. And the costume design is kind of bland and boring, but the sculpted and painted detail on this figure is done very well. He's got a few more points of articulation than most figures in this series, and he scores a few extra points because he's one of the only figures that doesn't need a base to stand up. He can stand up just fine on his own. Unfortunately, the crescent moon shaped throwing weapon here is non-removable. It's sculpted in his belt. Even though this figure's not very exciting, I'm still glad to have him because he completes my set and I got him for dirt cheap. This Hollis Mason classic Night Owl figure has a swivel joint for the neck, ball hinge shoulders that go out about this far, 
and they do rotate all the way around. He has a bicep swivel joint. He has a single hinged elbow joint. And he has rotation at the top of his glove cuff right there. Nothing in the waist, no ab crunch. He has swivel hips that go out about this far forward and this far back. And he has a single jointed knee. And it looks like he would have a swivel joint at the top of his boot here, but he does not. Here's the DC Direct Watchmen movie style Dr. Manhattan figure. And this is probably my favorite out of the entire line. I think he looks exactly like he did in the movie. I really like the sparkly blue plastic that they cast him in. There isn't much paintwork on this figure. Unfortunately, the symbol on Dr. Manhattan's forehead is a little off center. And I didn't hand pick this Dr. Manhattan figure because if I had, I would have waited to find one that had a symbol that was straight. The articulation on this Dr. Manhattan figure is really limited, but the main reason why I like him is because of his alternate legs and his hovering effect. And to swap out the legs on this Dr. Manhattan figure, you just pull him apart at the waist and snap on these non-articulated floating or hovering legs. And I think that works pretty well. The articulated legs for the Dr. Manhattan figure have a peg hole in the bottom of the right foot, but these legs have these little slots in the feet for this extra little floating effect piece, and they just slot in to these little slats on the inside of his feet and it creates a pretty nice hovering or levitating effect for Dr. Manhattan. This Dr. Manhattan figure has a neck joint that can go from side to side. He can look down a little bit but can't look up very far. And he has a nice tilt back and forth just like most of the other figures in this line. He has the ball hinge shoulders again. They can only go about this far down and go about this far out. And they also swivel all the way around. He has single hinged elbows with very little range of motion. He has no waist articulation. His hip joints are cut at this weird angle. It looks really nice and clean, but they're pretty useless as far as articulation goes. And he has single jointed knees that don't provide much range of motion either. So next up we have the DC Direct movie version of The Comedian. And this is obviously the older or more modern day, I guess, version of The Comedian because he has the gray on his temples. Unfortunately, this figure doesn't have a very good likeness to actor Jeffrey Dean Morgan, but he does have a few really nice touches that I like a lot, like the stogie there. I think the only other action figure that I have that actually came with a cigar in his mouth was the Dutch figure from NECA's Predator line. For accessories, this movie comedian figure comes with a pair of pistols that actually have the smiley face painted on the grip. I really appreciate that attention to detail. And they fit in these soft plastic holsters on the sides of his thighs really well. My comedian figure has several paint flaws, but one thing I do like is that he has the scar sculpted and painted on the side of his face. I like these shoulder pads a lot, and this one seems like it's sticking up a little bit, but that's only because I've had the figure pose pointing the gun for such a long time. And I think that if I heated it up with a hair dryer or some warm water, then it would lay down the way it's supposed to. The sculpted detail on this comedian figure is excellent in my opinion. And aside from the kind of so-so likeness to Jeffrey Dean Morgan, I think he looks just like he did in the movie. This comedian figure has a neck joint that can turn from side to side, not much range of motion going up or down, and he can tilt his head a little bit from side to side too. He has ball hinge shoulders that go out about this far and swivel back and forth. He has a single jointed elbow that has almost no range of motion. A swivel at the wrist. Nothing at the waist. He has hip joints that move about this far forward and only about this far back. He has single jointed knees that move about that far and he has a rotation at the top of his boot cuff. Here we have the Watchmen movie Silk Spectre 2 figure by DC Direct and this is easily the worst figure in the entire set. There's very minimal articulation on this figure. The likeness to the actress is horrible. Uh, from the neck down the sculpting on the figure is okay 
but the paintwork is really, really sloppy. About the best part of this figure is the nice paint wash that's done to the hair. One thing that's really bizarre about this figure is that she has the nipples sculpted on her breasts, and I don't remember that detail in the movie, <laughs> but uh, I don't know, I just think that they could have easily gone without doing that. I thought that was pretty strange. This Silk Spectre 2 figure has almost no range of motion in the neck. Her uh, hair is really rigid and doesn't give it all. That's about as far as you can turn it from side to side. Basically, the only thing you can do is have her look straight ahead or look up. She has ball hinge shoulders that go up about this far, and they also spin all the way around if you want. She has single jointed elbows, and that's it except for a really shitty thigh swivel that's totally useless. This figure has seven points of articulation. The paint is pretty lousy, and the likeness is horrible. This is an all-time low for DC Direct. Here we have the DC Direct version of Ozymandias, the smartest man on the cinder. I think the likeness to the actor is passable for this figure, but the paint job is done pretty poorly and doesn't do the sculpt any favors. From the neck down, he's got really nice sculpted and painted detail, and it's not DC Direct's fault, it's the costume designer, I guess, from the Watchmen movie, but I absolutely hate this costume design for Ozymandias. I much prefer the comic book style Ozymandias costume. This Ozymandias figure has pretty nice neck articulation. He can look side to side without any problems. He can look down a little bit, up a little bit, and he has a really nice range of motion there. He has ball hinge shoulders that go out about that far and swivel back and forth. He has single jointed elbows, swivel wrist joints, he has a swivel at the hip, and single jointed knees. The DC Direct Movie Watchmen figures came with these really cool display bases that come with removable pegs that fit in the bottom like this. So you can move them around wherever you like to display your figures. And they also came with little connector pieces that you can use to connect these bases together if you like and in whatever kind of arrangement. I prefer to use these clear plastic NECA peg stands for my watching figures because of the way I made this diorama. I like to use these display stands for other figures in my collection add some height to characters in the back of my shelves. Here we have the Mattel comic book style Dr. Manhattan figure. Mattel used to do these action figure subscriptions on their Maddie Collector website where they wanted you to commit to buying a bunch of repainted figures all at once, a lot of times not even knowing what characters you were going to get. And then they would spoon feed them to you over the course of a year. They did this with Masters of the Universe, Ghostbusters, DCUC, and with the Watchmen figures. I never liked this concept very much, and eventually it failed. Mattel doesn't do it anymore. These comic book style Watchmen figures were from the Black Freighter Club, and as it turns out, Mattel wound up selling them individually on their website too. That's how I got mine. If you were patient, then you could have gotten these figures marked down on the website, and they also popped up at some brick and mortar stores in the last year or so. I want to say GameStop was one of them. Most of these comic book style Watchmen figures from Mattel were reused parts from DC Universe Classics figures, with a few new parts added. This Dr. Manhattan figure uses the slimmer male DCUC buck with a new head, new hands, and new feet. This figure is cast in light blue plastic, and there's very little paintwork on him. The paintwork on his face is really nice, but the edges of his black speedo are really, really sloppy. So like I said, these Mattel Watchmen figures are based on DC Universe Classics figures, so if you have any of those, then this is not really going to be a shock to you. The head can turn from side to side, no problem. You can look up a little bit and look down a little bit also. He's got ball hinge shoulders that go out about this far. They rotate all the way around. He's got a bicep swivel that works pretty good single jointed elbow, a swivel wrist joint, he's got an ab crunch that's pretty stiff on this figure, waist swivel, he's got this really hideous hip joint, hip articulation that DC Universe Classics and DC Multiverse have. I don't really care for it anymore. He's got this really ugly swivel joint in the mid thigh that I always bitch about, single jointed knees, 
and he can flex and point his toes, but there is no ankle rocker. This comedian figure looks alright on your shelf, but like most of these Mattel figures, he has a few problems. First and foremost, Mattel neglected to paint the smiley face on his button, which is a pretty crucial detail, so I had to paint it myself. The head sculpt on this figure looks really great, but it would have been really cool to get an old scarred face alternate head and a young unscarred alternate head so you could have all three different eras of the comedian. The pistols are molded into the holsters and lack the smiley face detail painted on the grips like the DC Direct version has. He comes with a flamethrower, but the plastic they use is so soft and pliable that it's hard to get this part of it looking straight. He also comes with this pump shotgun that I prefer to use in my DC Direct Comedian figure. All the paintwork on this figure is pretty good though. There are lots of little buttons and buckles that are painted nicely, and he has a subtle blue shading on parts of his uniform. This Comedian figure can turn his head from left to right. It's a little stiff there. He can look up a little bit more than most DC Universe style figures can. can. Look down a little bit. He has a ball hinge shoulder. I wish that the disc in here had been cast in red plastic instead of flesh tone plastic. This figure has a swivel bicep, single jointed elbow, wrist swivel. The ab crunch on this figure is really hindered by this harness. He can turn his waist a little bit. He has that Really ugly thigh gap, that useless thigh swivel, single jointed knees with very little range of motion, and a pivot at the ankle, but no ankle rocker. Here's the Mattel comic book style Silk Spectre, and she's a reuse of the DCUC adult female body with new arms that lack bicep swivel for some reason, a new head that looks pretty comic book accurate, and this yellow tinted soft plastic shell for a sheer blouse and skirt. I think this is fairly well done, even though sometimes it looks like there's moisture trapped inside it when it gets pressed up against your body. The paint on her heels is sloppy, but her face is really nice and clean, and she has nice paint shading on her hair and her sleeves. This Silk Spectre 2 figure really can't turn her head at all from left to right because the hair is too rigid and won't allow her head to move back and forth. She has ball hinge shoulders that go up pretty far and they go all the way around. No bicep swivel. She has single jointed elbows with very little range of motion. She has swivel wrists. She has no ab crunch and her waist twist is a little hindered by this blouse and skirt one piece shell thing that she has over. Can you see what I'm saying about it looks like there's moisture trapped in there? It may be mold release, but it's not water. I've never had these figures around water, and uh, they've been kept in a nice dry place. She got the DCUC style hips that are pretty well hidden by the skirt there, but the skirt also makes it where you can't really use them that much. Again, she's got that really ugly thigh cut joint, single jointed knees, and ankles that pivot back and forth. No ankle rocker, unfortunately. This Rorschach figure is reusing the same legs and upper arms as every DCUC figure wearing pants and a suit. So that makes him a little taller than he should be. The head, jacket, forearms, and maybe the gloves are all new for this figure. He has comic book accurate detail like the missing button on his jacket and the loose strap on his shoulder. His paint looks alright except for the scarf, which looks a little sloppy. Rorschach comes with his gas-powered grappling hook launcher, but I never display him with it because it's about three or four times bigger than it should be. There's no way he could store this in his jacket like he does in the comics. This Rorschach figure can turn his head to the left and to the right, but he can't really look up or down at all. He has a ball hinge shoulder. He has a bicep swivel that looks terrible. I wish they'd taper the shoulder down a little bit more and like sculpt the bicep swivel on jackets like this so it overlaps the shoulder a little bit so you don't get this really ugly cut joint in the bicep. I really really hate that. He's got single jointed elbows. He's got swivel wrists. He probably has an ab crunch underneath this jacket but it's useless. He has a waist swivel. I assume he has DCUC style hips under there but you can't use them at all because this jacket. He has this thigh swivel 
which I don't mind so much on this figure because you can't really see that cut there. He has single jointed knees, move about this far, and almost no range of motion in the ankle here. This Night Owl figure is my least favorite from this set because the paint apps on his face look like shit and the articulation is hindered so much by this really hard plastic cape. I think this would have been much better with either a cloth cape or a softer rubbery plastic cape. At this point in the comics, Dan Dryberg has gone soft and is a little out of shape, so Mattel sculpted a new torso to reflect that, but reused the same muscular legs that they used for all the adult males from the DC Universe Classics line. So this Night Owl 2 doesn't look very consistent. This Night Owl figure does have a new belt that looks pretty nice, and he comes with more accessories than most Mattel figures do. He comes with his gas-powered grappling hook launcher and three Owlerangs, or crescent moon-shaped throwing weapons. This Night Owl 2 figure can turn his head from side to side, but he can't really look up at all, he can't look down. His uh, arms and shoulders there, in particular, are really restricted by this cape. Can't really move his arms much more than that. He's got a bicep swivel and a single jointed elbow. He's got swivel wrists. He's got an ab crunch joint that only moves this far. This figure either doesn't have a waist twist or mine's really stuck and I don't want to try and force it and risk breaking it. He's got the same DCUC style hips that are really functional but just look terrible. That ugly ass thigh swivel single jointed knees and he can flex and point his toes again there's no ankle pivot and finally is my favorite from this set the DCUC style comic book Ozymandias figure by Mattel just like Night Owl 2's cape his tunic is made out of such hard plastic that the articulation in the torso and arms is almost non-existent but this is the best painted figure from the whole set and I really love the gold and purple color scheme it really makes this figure stand out in your collection. Most of the time when you see Ozymandias in the comics, he's just standing around anyway, so it doesn't bother me as much as Night Owl that you can't get him in a really dynamic pose. This figure also comes with an alternate masked head, but I much prefer the unmasked version. I love the paint detail on the entire figure, but I especially like the dry brushing effect on his hair. It would have been awesome if he'd come with an interchangeable hand with a bullet sculpted in his palm and some blood painted on it. Also, it would have been really cool to get a figure of Bubastis, the genetically engineered cat that Ozymandias keeps as a pet, but that would have required an entirely new sculpt for Mattel, which they were too cheap to do at this point. And finally, here's Ozymandias. He can turn his head from left to right. He can look up quite a bit, more so than a lot of the other figures anyway, and he can look down quite a bit too. He has basically no range of motion in his shoulders, bicep swivel, or his ab crunch joint. You can twist his biceps about that much. Really limited by this really hard plastic tunic that he has. He has single jointed elbows, swivel wrist joints, he has a swivel at the waist, he has those hip joints that are really well hidden by his shirt tail there. I think that's pretty good. And you can still have him kick his legs forward and back quite a bit even though this is such rigid hard plastic. He's got the mid thigh swivel joint there, single jointed knees, and he can pivot his foot back and forth, but there is no ankle rocker on this figure either. These Mattel Watchmen figures all come with the same action figure stand with one peg on it, and I typically don't like figure stands like this where it has a logo or a character's name on it but for some reason I really like these a lot. The paint on these is fairly decent and the letters are actually sculpted onto the base. Here's the Mattel comic book style Night Owl 2 flanked by the movie versions of Night Owl 1 and Night Owl 2 by DC Direct. Here's the Mattel comic book style Ozymandias next to the DC Direct movie version of Ozymandias. Here's the comic book style version of Rorschach by Mattel next to the DC Direct movie version of Rorschach. Here we have the comic book style Silk Spectre 2 with the original Silk Spectre and the Silk Spectre 2 from DC Direct. Here we have the DC Direct movie comedian figure next to the 
comic book style comedian figure by Mattel. And like I said, I like to use the shotgun that came with the Mattel comic book style comedian figure with my DC Direct comedian figure. I just think it looks better. And finally, here is the Mattel comic book style Dr. Manhattan figure next to the movie style Dr. Manhattan figure. Typically, I'm a big proponent of mixing and matching different action figure lines. You know, sometimes the figure's really hard to find or too expensive on the secondary market, and you just want that character represented in your collection somehow. I mix Marvel Legends and Marvel Select figures quite a bit. I don't think you could really get by with it with these Watchmen figures. The only one I think you could maybe skate by on is fudging in the movie Dr. Manhattan with the comic book style Watchmen figures, but even then, he's got so much more detail in his sculpting that I think he would really stand out. But at the end of the day, it's your collection. You shouldn't let anybody else tell you how to display your figures. And unfortunately, you can't use the floating effect piece that came with the movie Dr. Manhattan figure on the DCUC style Mattel Dr. Manhattan figure because he doesn't have the slots in his feet. So if you're watching this and for some reason haven't read the Watchmen comic book series or haven't seen the movie, then I really recommend them both. This was written by Alan Moore and drawn by Dave Gibbons, and it is excellent. This is definitely not for kids and probably wouldn't be good for people who are just getting into comics. Despite the colorful costumes, this is not your typical superhero fare. So even if you don't normally go for big two superhero stuff, this is still really worth checking out. I'd also like to point out that DC loves to throw this quote around that The Watchmen is one of Time Magazine's 100 best novels. But DC Comics is owned by Time Warner, who also owns Time Magazine. So this is just a shameless self-promotion. It's just like me saying, I make one of the top 100 greatest meatloaves ever made. I picked up all these before Watchmen prequel comics when they came out in 2012. I didn't have time to reread each one of them for this video, and I don't think they were very well received at the time. I remember thinking that most of them were just alright. I got this Rorschach series signed by writer Brian Azzarello at a local con a few years ago, and this was drawn by Lee Bermejo, so it looks amazing. This Silk Spectre miniseries was written by the late Darwin Cook and illustrated by Amanda Connor, and I got her signature on the complete run a few years ago at a local convention. This comedian book by Brian Azzarello and illustrated by J.G. Jones is really disturbing. It follows Eddie Blake through the Vietnam War, explores his relationship with the Kennedys, and in fact, the comedian actually murders Marilyn Monroe at Jackie Kennedy's request. By the end of this story, the comedian stumbles across the plans for the psychic bomb and the spaghetti monster that Adrian Veidt has engineered. It's been like five years since I read these, and I don't remember much about this Dr. Manhattan miniseries by Michael Straczynski and Adam Hughes. And the manager at the local comic book shop I've been going to said that the last issue of this miniseries has gone up in price recently because it's become relevant to what DC is doing with their Doomsday Clock story. This is the Dollar Bill one-shot written by the late Lynn Wine with art by Steve Rude. And this is the Moloch two-parter, written by Michael Straczynski, with art by Eduardo Riso. Here we have the Ozymandias miniseries, written by the late Lynn Wine again, and illustrated by Jay Lee. And I remember this being one of my favorites from the series, so I might go back and reread this. But definitely the artwork is excellent. I think that Jay Lee is a pretty good fit for this miniseries. And um, like I said, I remember liking this one more than most of the Before Watchmen prequels. And here we have the Before Watchmen Minutemen miniseries. This was written and illustrated by Darwin Cook. I was fortunate enough to get all of these signed by Darwin Cook at a local comic book convention several years ago. This was my absolute favorite out of all the Before Watchmen miniseries. I think Darwin Cook was a really great comics creator. I really enjoyed New Frontier and Batman Ego especially. I think it's a real shame that he passed away. And I think that this Minutemen book is definitely worth checking out. Alright, and finally we have the Night Owl Before Watchmen miniseries. This was written by J. Michael Straczynski with artwork by my two favorite Kuberts, Joe and Andy. And I don't remember really anything about this comic book series except that Rorschach guest stars in it. I guess 
Night Owl is not even interesting enough to carry a four-issue story arc. Another thing about these I forgot to mention before is that they all had backups. They were like prequels, I guess, to the Black Freighter crap from the original Watchmen story. And I found it really, really boring and uninteresting. The only reason I felt compelled to read it was because I was spending three ninety nine per comic book. So I went to the local comic book shop on Wednesday before Thanksgiving and picked up this Doomsday Clock number one of a 12-part series. And I sprung for the lenticular cover because I thought that was pretty badass. Also, the comic book shop was giving away these free promotional posters and these Doomsday Clock buttons. I thought that was really cool. And, you know, the Before Watchmen was a cash grab and this is a cash grab also. Hopefully this turns out to be pretty good. I read this first issue and I actually really enjoyed it. I'm not a huge fan of a lot of Jeff John's stuff. He's written some stuff that I did really enjoy. Even if this turns out to be terrible, it's still got amazing artwork by Gary Frank. So even though I complained about a few of these figures, I'm still really happy to have them. and This collection means a lot to me. Now I picked up the Hollis Mason Night Owl on clearance for four dollars. But the rest of these I bought from a friend of mine named Sean. Sean passed away rather suddenly not too long ago. I met him on a local Star Wars fan forum years ago, and we weren't really close personal friends, but we did some trades and helped each other out several times. We'd pick up figures that we knew the other was having trouble finding. Sometimes I'd see something and text him a picture of it to see if it was something he was looking for. He hooked me up quite a few times, and there are a bunch of Star Wars figures in particular that I wouldn't have in my collection if it weren't for Sean. He was really funny and he was a super nice guy, and the world is worse off for him not being here anymore. Now I'm not trying to bring you down or anything like that, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention him now because every time I see these Watchmen figures or some other part of my collection that Sean sold to me, helped me find, or traded to me, I always think of him. I feel fortunate to have known him, and I was glad to count him as a friend. So my wife and I saw Justice League last week, and we were pleasantly surprised, but only because our expectations were in the toilet. The movie feels like it should have come out 10 or 15 years ago. I would rank Justice League somewhere around the first two Fantastic Four movies, the theatrical cut of Daredevil, Ghost Rider, and Green Lantern. Since people complained BBS was such a convoluted clusterfuck, Warner Brothers overcorrected and made the plot for Justice League overly simple and generic. Wonder Woman and Aquaman were cool, and even though they didn't give him very much to do, I actually really liked Cyborg. I think if he gets the opportunity, Ray Fisher could pull off a really strong solo movie. Superman finally feels like the Superman we all know and love, and the whole mustache thing isn't as obvious as the internet would lead you to believe. It's apparent that Ben Affleck doesn't want to be Batman anymore, and I would love to see some younger, unknown actor cast in the role. Speaking of Superman and Batman, their costumes look really funky, and I imagine that's probably because... They changed a lot of the colors in the movie to make it more bright. Ezra Miller's flash is obnoxious, his running looks totally awkward, and I absolutely hate the costume design. Many of the sets, like the Batcave and rooftops in particular, feel really small and claustrophobic. And the CG looks cheap considering how much the movie cost. Finally, I was really looking forward to Danny Elfman's score, but it doesn't stand out at all. And there was only one brief moment where I noticed a shade of his 1989 Batman theme. Now, after having said all that, Justice League isn't particularly offensive like Batman vs. Superman was. Justice League is the superhero movie equivalent of rice cakes. It's not all that bad, but it's not like you're going to say, Mmm, I'm really craving rice cakes today. Rice cakes would really hit the spot right now. Or, Ooh, those rice cakes sure are satisfying. I've talked a lot of shit about the DCEU or whatever they want to call it, and these movies are pretty disappointing to me but only because I've been waiting my whole life to see these characters in live action. I love these characters so much that it really hurts when filmmakers don't do them justice on the big screen. Give yourself a pat on the back if you made it this far. I hope you found this video entertaining and informative. Maybe you'll be inspired to start your own collection of Watchmen action figures, check out the Zack Snyder Watchmen movie, or read some Watchmen comics. It seems like a pretty good time to be a Watchmen fan right now, and I'm cautiously optimistic about the new Doomsday Clock series. Maybe I'll do a review of it once it wraps up this time next year. Well, that's all for me today, so until next time, take care, and I'll talk to you again soon. Bye.